first week of Advent, pardon me, the second week of Advent, uh, in the fifth century, as I shared last week, church leaders decided that the church needed a time where people could commemorate the birth of Jesus and anticipate his return, his first coming, his second coming. He is coming back. I hope you know that. So the Advent season, these four weeks preceding Christmas, look both ways. They look back to his birth and forward to his return. And so last Sunday, we looked at the covenant between God and Abram that set up the first coming of Jesus. Today, we will see what Jesus himself and others have to say about his return. And we're going to see that Jesus wants us to live in anticipation of that event. Would you pray with me? Father, as we indeed approach this season of the celebration of the birth of your son, Father, I just pray that this day, as we think about his future arrival and what that portends, I pray that you would open our hearts to your word, empower each one of us by your spirit, and through your word and through your spirit, change us. For the sake of your kingdom, in the name of Jesus, I pray, amen. Toward the end of his time of actual ministry in the flesh, his physical ministry, Jesus was in a conversation with his disciples as they were leaving the temple one day. You know, these guys, these disciples, they uh, weren't sophisticated people. They were, they were country boys. They were from, they were from up country. Uh, they weren't city sophisticates. And being in the temple, being in the city and in the temple was really for them big stuff. And they were looking, you know, wow, wow. Jesus, look at that. Of course, Jesus has seen it all. Uh, but they want to talk about how, how utterly amazing and wonderful the temple was. And then he gave them some really bad news, telling them that they would see the day when the temple would be destroyed. The massive stones separated one from the other and cast aside. Jesus began to future cast to describe what was coming. And much of it was not pretty. We're not going to read it all, not because it sounds like the script of a post-apocalyptic movie, but because we don't have time to deal with it in its entirety today. You know, though, I sometimes wonder if Hollywood doesn't get some of its script ideas from Scripture. You know, it, when you, you read the Bible and you see these things happening, you, you see the stories that are told, and, and then you see some things on screen and you... You think, is that where that came from? This conversation is actually recorded in three of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And Matthew, of course, was the only eyewitness to the event, to the conversation. Today we're going to begin with Matthew 24, and let's look together at the opening lines in verse 3, and, and uh, pardon me, let's look together at the opening lines jump past some of the heavy stuff to get to the meat of what Jesus was saying to his friends and to us at the ocean on the 8th of December, about 20 centuries, 2,000 years later. In Matthew 24, verse 3, Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives as the disciples came to him privately. Now, this is immediately after this looking at these big stones, looking at this monster building, looking at all this beauty and glory. And they said to him privately, tell us, they said, when will this happen? And what will be the sign of your coming at the end of the age? And Jesus says, starts off, watch out that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name claiming to be, claiming I am the Messiah and will deceive many. Now let's jump across to verse 36. But about that day or hour, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son. I don't know. But only the Father. As it was in the days of Noah, so will it be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, up to the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That's how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. 
in this presentation of a future history, Jesus talks about what life is going to be like. And he points Peter and company back across some 20 centuries to 20, or some 25 centuries, 2,500 years, to the story, to the event of Noah and the flood. Now, Peter and his friends were much more familiar with the story of Noah than many people are in the world today. People have differing ideas about Noah. Noah was a critical figure in their history. Noah was part of their story. Noah was part of their culture. And right here, I need to throw in a sidebar. It's early, but let's do it. Um, because I realize there may be folks in the room today or who might watch on the video for whom Noah is a total stranger. It happens. This week I asked a question several times at random. Several people here today were asked this question, and I won't tell you what all their answers were. I will tell you that Beatrice got it right. But I asked people to tell me about Noah, or to do a word association. I would say Noah and see what they would say back. I said Noah, Beatrice said, Mark, pretty good. I admit it wasn't a scientific survey. I was not careful selecting my participants to make sure I got a, a proper broad sampling. It was really pretty random, but an amazing number told me that Noah is the name of a small boxy looking car built by Toyota. <laughs> they were right. They were right. How Toyota chose Noah as a name for a car is beyond my comprehension. Others told me that Noah was one of the great prophets in the history of Islam. They were right, because his name appears in Surah 21 of the Quran. Some told me he was an old man who built a boat to save many animals and his family. They were right, because that's a simple summation of the story lifted from Genesis. I looked up Noah on Wikipedia, and Wikipedia says he's a character of fiction. And they're right. Because he's been the subject of an incredible number of movies across the years. The first one was a silent movie before sound movies became reality. There was a, a movie about Noah produced in 1928, and at that point, it was the most expensive movie ever made. There's a new one called Noah that's due out in March, starring Anthony Hopkins as Methuselah and Russell Crowe as Noah. Would you, when it comes to Dar, would somebody please tell me, I want to go see it with you? Seriously. I want to see what Hollywood does with this. I took the time. I looked up the trailer, watched it, loved it. And uh, so, uh, but I do need to tell you there was a delay in production. I'm serious. Production was delayed. There was a bad storm and the theater lot flooded. The, the, the movie lot flooded and the boat didn't float. <laughs> the plastic arc was damaged. Perhaps God didn't approve of the script. But to make sure we're all on the same page here, we're going to take a quick look at the opening passages of Genesis and recap the Noah story quickly. You know, there's no way this side of heaven that anyone can absolutely be sure, can absolutely know how much time is covered in chapter 1. If you're curious about it, I'm going to talk about it on January the 5th. Um, the sermon tentatively is entitled... Um, the beginning of everything, January the 5th, here at the ocean. Uh, so if you're curious about Genesis chapter 1, come on January 5th. But between chapters 2 and 6, there is approximately 1,600 years, 16 centuries comprised in that framework of Genesis 2 through 6. As I said, we don't know. Genesis one may have been seven days. It may have been seven aeons of time. We don't know, and I'll, again, I'll talk about that. But from Genesis 2 through 6, 2 till 6, we have 1,600 years. The first two chapters of Genesis give us the creation story, including the making of Adam, Adam and Eve. The third chapter recounts the fall of man, Adam and Eve's efforts to cover their nakedness and their futile effort to hide from God, and their eviction from paradise that God had made for them. The next two chapters, 4 and 5, show the growing family, the first record of offerings to God, the first record of murder, as well as the beginning of worship. And it's in the fifth chapter that we first encounter a 500-year-old man named Noah. 
I told you last week, there's a lot in Scripture that I have a hard time getting my head around, and one of those is the fact somebody can live that old. You know, if Noah lived to be 500 when he was my age, he was still a boy. Think about that. In the sixth chapter, some 1,600 years later, 1,600 years after Adam lost a rib and got a wife, we see God repenting of what he had done, sorry that he had ever created man, and deciding to wipe man from the face of the planet to delete his creation, to hit reformat firmly. Then we come to verse 8, and we read the word, but. Here's that word again. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. God decided to destroy every corrupt thing, except he chose to save Noah and his family and the gene pool of every living, air-breathing creature on the planet. He tells this very old man, in our perspective, this very old 500-year-old man, to build a boat. He gives him the specs for a giant barge that's to be 150 meters long, 15 meters high, 25 meters wide. He goes on to tell him he's to load breeding stock of every land animal and bird, every reptile and insect, in order to restock the planet. He's to stock enough food for all the wildlife. 100 years later, the boat's ready. The food is stockpiled. And the birds begin to arrive. Rats, mice, lemurs, elephants, snakes, lizards, the tortoise and the hare, cockroaches and spiders. Breeding pairs of every air-breathing creature on planet Earth. The Bible says they came, to the, they came to Noah and entered the ark. Then the Lord shut the door on the boat. The skies opened. The rains came. And the earth shook, and vast subterranean reservoirs ruptured and spilled themselves, and for 40 days the waters rose. For five months, planet Earth was truly water world. Its highest peaks underwater, and a large wooden barge with a gene pool of every living, air-breathing creature on the planet sealed inside, floated on the surface. Then in chapter 8 and verse 1, we hit another but. But God remembered Noah and the animals, and sent a wind. And the wind not only began to dry the, the water, but it pushed the barge toward its eventual resting place, its landing place, where Noah, his family, and his precious cargo would disembark, and life would begin again. This, this wasn't, isn't supposed to be a sermon about Noah, and it's not. It's simply a long sidebar to help you understand the connections that Peter, James, John, and the rest of them would have had going on in their heads as Jesus was talking. Noah was part of their reality. And so they were able to connect to that. The life people lived at the time of Noah, it, the, the carelessness, the frivolity, and all of that, they were able to connect with that and see that God is still in charge. So if you want the rest of his story... Open your Bible this afternoon, start with Genesis chapter 6, and read through chapter 9. But let's get back to this week's conversation, the second Sunday of Advent. Remember, Jesus was simply doing what Coco has taught us that we need to do as teachers and communicators. He was endeavoring to connect new material, new information to information they already had on their soft drives. Stored in our long-term memory. Jesus continues this conversation right through chapter 25, explaining signs and indicators of his promised return and creates a parable of people who are invited to a wedding and are waiting for the wedding to begin. How many of you ever went to a wedding that did not happen on schedule? <laughs> I have one friend who ended his years in East Africa telling me at one point he had one regret. He had never seen an African wedding. <laughs> How could you have lived here all these years and, and, and done all that you've done and never seen a wedding? I said, Didn't you ever, you've never gone to a wedding? He said, oh, I've gone to a lot of them. I've just never seen one. I said, what do you mean? Now, you've got to understand, he's German. Okay? He said, they told me the wedding was at 3 o'clock. So I got there on time. I waited an hour. 
and I decided I'd misunderstood and went home. Now, I learned early on to always carry a book when I go to a wedding, sometimes two. Now I carry an MP3 player and listen to sermons and whatever. I, I carry a Kindle and, and read. Uh, but I go to weddings. I enjoy them. But I've learned to wait. In fact, about 20 years ago, I went out in Maasai country in South Kenya. And, uh, and the wedding was all day. It started with, of course, since I had the only vehicle in the area, uh, I was asked to go to the bride's boma and collect the bridal party. And so I took the groom and the groomsmen in the Land Rover, and we went to the bride's boma, and, and the wedding actually began there. And it began pretty well on time, because that's when it really started. The church event was scheduled for 11 o'clock. It didn't happen until 3, because the family wasn't ready, and the negotiations went on and on and on. And I drank interminable cups of chai that morning. But I spent all day at that wedding. Exactly 10 days later, I walked down the aisle of a church in Richmond, Virginia with my younger, with my elder daughter in a white gown holding my arm. And we entered the church when the mistress of ceremony said, Go! And we've been told how long we had. And I walked her down the aisle. The pastor of the church said, Who gives this woman to be wed? I gave the proper answer, her mother and I. And then I handed her over to this young man who I was supposed to trust with my precious daughter. And then I walked up and I replaced the pastor at the microphone and I led these two young people, far, far too young. I led them in their wedding vows. I remember there was another thought going through my mind. While, while I'm doing the wedding vows, th there was a, a, a sidetrack running in my head. And the thought was, for the amount of money this is costing me, this is going entirely too fast. <laughs> but it happened on time. We started on time, closed on time. Everything was done on time and we were gone. But here's the story, Matthew 25, beginning with verse 1. And remember, Jesus is still answering their question, when? At that time, Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. The wise ones, however, took oil along in their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming. They all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out, Here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all the virgins woke and trimmed their lamps. The foolish one said to the wise, Give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. Oh no, they replied, There may not be enough for both us and you. Instead, go to those who sell and buy some for yourselves. So while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the others came also, Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. He replied, truly, I tell you, I don't know you. In Jesus' words, therefore, keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. Look at this verse again, verse 13 of chapter 20, pardon me, verse 13 of the 25th chapter. Jesus throws in a therefore. He's told the story. Then he says, therefore, keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. And I do, I do believe that was his charge. That is his charge to them, and it's his charge to us today. Keep watch. Here at this conclusion of the parable of the young ladies invited to the wedding, we come to the crux of our, conver of our conversation today. Keep watch. Be ready. Anticipate. I took some journalism courses in college, that was a long, long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. And I have forgotten more than I remember. But one thing I do remember is the first rule of a good reporter or news writer is to make sure you communicate the answer to one simple question. Five words. Who did what 
where, when? Answer that question accurately, and the story's complete. Who did what, where, when? The disciples in the conversation recorded early in chapter 24 knew part of the answer. They knew the what and the who parts of the answer. What was the what? The what was the return of Christ. That's what they were talking about. Who was the who? The who then and the who now is Jesus. Like us, they were endeavoring to be Christ-centered. They were answering the question, they were questioning the when. Lord, when? When will you return? When will you end this age? When will you establish your kingdom? And Jesus in his answer said that only God knows the when. Interestingly, at that, at that moment, they were pretty close to the where. Because not too long after this conversation, he would be arrested. He would die a criminal's death. He would be buried in a borrowed tomb. He would rise from the dead, and they would return together with him to the Mount of Olives, that location again with him. They would have another similar conversation on that same hilltop, and we see it in Acts 1, verse 16, verse 6. They gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? He said to them, it's not for you to know the time or the dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power. When the Holy Spirit comes on you, you will be wit my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the skies he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said. Why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Those who were with him that day never forgot that promise. For the rest of their lives, they lived in anticipation, waiting for the bridegroom, with their lamps filled and refilled, waiting, looking for his return, teaching about it, reminding the church of that day and us today of the need for vigilant anticipation. Peter, in his second epistle, calls out for persistent readiness. Paul, who was a latecomer to the party, joined the other apostles in their lifelong sojourn. And his letters to believers in Thessalonica are an incredible proclamation of joyful anticipation. As we move forward toward the third Sunday of Advent and on towards Christmas, I want to encourage each of us to be like Noah, in these days, like Noah, to walk with God. To anticipate what God is going to do in the world. To be His hands and His feet reaching out in tangible ways to demonstrate the reality of the Incarnation. And this, this event next Sunday at, at Crescini is an incredible opportunity to do just that. To reach out to others in tangible ways to demonstrate the Incarnation. To demonstrate that God indeed is with us and act with Him in love and grace. Now, across the church world, I will admit, there are, there, there are multiple perspectives on how to read and interpret Scripture. I'm sure that across, even across this room, there are a range of views on how to read, interpret, and apply Scripture in our lives. Some will be a staunch conservative, the Bible says it, I believe it, that settles it point of view all the way to the far opposite end of the spectrum to a view that says that much or all of the Old Testament and the revelation of John is simply allegory, a collection of old legends and fanciful stories with possible, possible application to our lives. My friend, one thing about our community is that we um, need to agree to disagree sometimes without getting mad at each other, uh, without getting angry, uh, without fighting, and certainly don't get mad enough to leave the ocean. Really, you know, we only have to believe one thing. You only have to believe the really hard part. You only have to believe the impossible part. The one thing that for me has been and continues to be 
the hardest of all to believe. To believe that just this one sentence is absolutely true. God so loved the world. He gave his only begotten son. But whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. You see, I don't have a problem believing in the power of God. I don't. I find it much easier to believe in the power of God than to believe in the love of God. I can believe that God indeed did speak into nothing and create the universe. But I have trouble believing that he would forgive the times I live in ways that insult him and bring him pain. And if I believe he's the creator, then I can believe that he could easily create enough water to flood the earth and cover Kilimanjaro and Everest with a thousand meters of water. I can believe in the miraculous and I can pray and believe for miracles. I can pray and believe for healing in your life and see it in your body and see it happen. But the hardest part it is for me to believe is that God, our omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient God would love us enough, would love me enough to be willing to abandon his divinity and be born in shame and poverty in order to fulfill a 2,000 year old commitment that was broken in payment for that broken covenant to fall and redeem us to restore us to what he designed us to be in the first place that is hard for me to believe, I have a hard time getting my head around that but in his grace He gives me faith to believe even the hard stuff. Yes, I believe. And I believe with every fiber of my being that he is coming back again. I believe that Jesus will return. And his teaching across the Jordan Valley and in the Galilee and the towns and villages, it's believed that Jesus largely spoke the common, the language of the common people. It's called Aramaic. I only know one expression in Aramaic. You probably know it as well, even if you don't know that it's Aramaic. We have that Maranatha word up on screen, please. There it is, Aramaic. Maranatha. This expression was used throughout the first century church and for years later. And even today we say it many times without awareness of its true significance. There's actually a dual meaning on, depending on how it's spoken, how it's pronounced. And both meanings apply to Advent. Let's look at the second. There we go, second slide right there. If we say Maranatha, you're saying... The Lord has come. Amen? You believe it? He's come. If you say instead, let's look at the next slide. Marana Tha. You're saying, come, Lord. Marana Tha. Come, Lord. The Apostle Paul closed his first epistle to Corinth with Marana, Marana Tha, come, Lord. John closed this incredible document that we call the Revelation with a prayer, come, Lord Jesus. On the crest of the Mount of Olives, overlooking the old city of Jerusalem, there's a simple neighborhood mosque, much like the hundreds of others you will see scattered across any city in the Middle East. And even in that holy city that's holy to so many religions. But just beside that mosque is a small courtyard. And in that courtyard is a small tower. Just a small tower marking a spot where it's believed that Jesus had his last conversation and where he departed from when he left his disciples and went to heaven. And where the angel reminded them and reminds us 
that he's coming back. A few years ago, Coco and I had the opportunity to visit Israel and the holy city, and we spent time on the Mount of Olives. Early one morning, we visited that courtyard. Beside that small tower, I lifted my hand towards the sky, and I spoke the only words I know in the Aramaic language. I said, Maranatha. 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 Come, Lord Jesus. Would you stand with me today? Would you lift your hands and cry out to him the second day of it, the second Sunday of Advent? Would you just lift your hands and say, Maranatha. Maranatha. Say it loudly. Maranatha. Yes, Lord Jesus, come. We look for your coming. We anticipate your coming. We long for your coming. Yes, Lord Jesus, come. Not only come in our hearts and lives, but come into this world. Let your kingdom come. It will be done in our hearts, in our lives, in this city, in this nation, and in this world. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. Once again, Coco's not here. I talked to her last night. She's in Accra. Got there last, yesterday afternoon. And uh, she, uh, she's not here to give these to you, but she wrote the takeaways for us. Uh, she and I were commu communicating all week long about the sermon, about this conversation. And uh, so she helped me with the takeaways and, and sends her greetings. But uh, the first one is, in many places... In the drive for profit, merchants will work to remind people that there's only a certain number of shopping days left till Christmas. Since Christmas is all about giving, it must also be about buying, according to them. And since today is the 8th, it means there's only 16 more shopping days till Christmas. As you think about gifts to give, family and friends, and I'm thinking about that, I'm trying to figure, what am I going to give Coco? Well, I need some help here, folks. You know, but anyway, uh, you know, if I was in America, I'd, I'd order something off Amazon, and the they deliver it to the door, and I wouldn't have to go shopping. But um, as you think about gifts to give and the friends and family, think about another gift to give. As followers of Christ, called to be His hands and feet extended, would you prayerfully look around? or someone outside your normal circle to whom you would normally give a gift, think of whom you might give a gift to, who you would normally give a gift to, but to do it in the name of Christ, a gift from Christ to them. Number two, in your expo groups and in other settings, consider together and think of someone you can give a gift to in order to share Christ's love to others, again, who might not be aware his love. Third, while you're thinking about gifts and the celebration of Christmas, think, pray, and discuss this question. How can you prepare yourself? How can we prepare ourselves as a gift for the celebration of his second coming, of his return? Mm -hmm.